In the spring of 2021, Garth Ruff, Ohio State University Extension Beef Field Specialist, and Jared Jabarik, Feedlot Systems Extension Educator at Michigan State University, hosted a three-part webinar series on management considerations for beef-sired calves from dairy cows. This first session on April 21st focused on marketing those dairy beef calves and featured Larry Rose and J.T. Lowell of JBS as they discuss the quality of the cattle they seek to purchase, their pricing structure, and the demands they have for high quality, consistently sized, and correctly finished dairy crossed beef cattle. I'm Larry Rose, and I'm uh, head of procurement for JBS Regional Beef, which is the, the regional plants for JBS is uh, Soderton, Pennsylvania, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Plainwell, Michigan, Omaha, Nebraska, and Tolleson, Arizona. Uh, at most of our regional beef plants, we, we uh, harvest both coal cows and mostly Holstein steers, uh, which is different than the fed division, which is mostly beef fed steers or some crossbreds too. Uh, probably, you know, for the last 20, 25 years, we, we've almost killed exclusively Holstein steers as opposed to crossbreds or anything else. And we've uh, basically built a brand, you know, of, of Holstein meat, which is called Five Star. And uh, over the years have, have built that up. You know, 20 years ago, you basically sold everything Holstein at a discount. Now, most of the cattle at that time uh, were, were Holstein yearling steers where people would run them on, on uh, say, grass until they weighed seven or eight or 900 pounds or silage. And then they put them on a ration. And within the last 20 years, basically, the Holstein steer markets changed to be, you know, a high energy ration at a young age, you know, either going on feed at 275 or 300 pounds, maybe 500 pounds. And, and within the last, you know, two or three years, we started seeing the crossbreeding of the steers. Uh, what, we've, what we know so far is they've, they've been pretty inconsistent as far as performance at the packing house level. Uh, you've, you've got everything. And I think a lot of it has to do with the genetics and I'm sure somebody else will be able to talk about that. But we we know that as many of them that are being crossbred that we were going to have to to uh, probably offer something for crossbred just because of the the low number of Holsteins or lower number of Holsteins and and the availability of the crossbreds and we've done some trials with uh, a few different people we we did uh, a trial a year ago with Penn State. Uh, probably wasn't a large enough trial to really say that that we really know too much at this point in time. We've done fab tests with yields at the packing house level on probably two to three thousand at a crossbred cattle and collected all the data uh, that we could. And and some of them have been really good and some of them have not been so good. Like I said, it's been a consistency thing. So far, I think when people first started crossbreeding, they were just trying to, you know, breed to anything that would throw a, a black hided calf and thinking that they were going to sell it as CAB, which they probably don't qualify for CAB, but that was kind of the, the intent when they started. And, and in the last couple of years, I think the, the semen companies have probably spent a lot more time trying to decide what, you know, what sires work best with, with the Holstein cows. And, and uh, it seems like there's some of them are getting better or most of them. And we don't, like I said, we, we started, you know, a couple of years ago and we, we probably don't have the best, most scientific information that, that we should have at this point in time, but that really hasn't been real easy to get to. So with that, we knew we were going to have to, to probably do something with the crossbred. So we developed a, a crossbred contract, so to speak, or a contract that would work for both Holstein steers and a crossbred steer. And with that, I'm going to kind of, I mean, if nobody has any questions, JT's a lot better authority on, on uh, the contracts than I would be. So I'm going to turn it over to him and he can kind of explain it. If, if anybody has any questions, we can 
kind of get to them towards the end or at any time, if you want to stop us, we could probably stop and answer questions. With that, there's JT Levy. Good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. You know, to add on uh, what Larry is, was talking about, the other thing that we've seen over the last seven or eight years is the, the national grade is, you know, in whole Kansas or Texas, and look at what the national, you know, what their grade by state has done. The last uh, couple of months, national grade's been over 80%. Um, and I think it follows a trend maybe from the 90s when, you know, we heard a lot about lean, 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 and let's make pork leaner and chickens, you know, the best and whatnot. So when I put this together, the 70% contract that we've used the last couple of decades, um, that was a, a big topic in, in the industry. And we had Walmart uh, that was actually taking a lot of our select meat. Uh, they were taking it uh, at three to five dollars better narrower than the choice select spread and it we got along really good uh having 30 percent select on the uh on the contract uh since then over the last 20 years um you know walmart's gone to to choice and cab uh our grade you know that 20 years ago would have averaged 71 to 2 percent choice and maybe two or three percent prime you know has moved to averaging 78 percent choice and an eight to ten percent prime so you know in our markets as there's been more of a value switch to higher quality you know we've we've lost a lot of, of our select market because we don't have much to sell and we've seen an improvement uh, in exports and, and higher quality uh, from, from people like Costco that are, are now, you know, they're actively promoting the prime product in their, in their meat cases. So over the last couple of years, uh, one, you know, when, when uh, another packer quit killing in Holstein's in 2016, you know, we spent about a year and a half just trying to keep up with all the Holsteins that were out there. And it's as that, you know, at that point, as we could not kill them all and our basis widened to minus 12 and minus 15. And then the auction barns as much as minus 30 or 35 on the cash market, the industry was forced to, to look at, at other uh, alternatives to what are we going to do with all of these bull caps? And we knew there was going to be a switch. We didn't know quite what it was. And the, you know, the first year and a half or so, the, the semen companies, you know, emptied a lot of tanks that they had and where we had a fairly consistent genetic base on the Holstein side, all of a sudden we had maybe 15 or 20,000 different bulls that were throwing calves that we really had no idea what they're going to be. And the first ones that we started running fab yields on, that's kind of what we saw that, that you know, a third of them, we were a lot better off just to have a straight Holstein. And, you know, a third of them were, were better and a third of them were equal. I think that has, has gotten better over the last two years since maybe, you know, 2019. Uh, but I, it's, it'll be interesting to see what they're breeding with today, you know, what that looks like 16 months down the road. Uh, we might actually be able to tell you you know, what kind of improvements they've made to the fab yields of the Holstein. But with the changes in the market and whatnot, what we wanted to do with the new contract or new contract specs is try to, or not try, we wanted to pay more for the higher quality and, and try to keep the, the selects about the same. So we went to more of a grid-based uh, contract uh, that is, roughly $5 dressed more per hundred on every animal. So if you take a 118 CME price and subtract $12, right, on our old contract and divide by 61%, it 
he come up with a base dress price of 173.77. And if you do the same uh, with 118 minus eight, and get to 110 and divide by a 61 and a half percent yield spec, you come up with 178, I believe it's 86. So on every animal, we've added $5 per hundred dressed to the initial uh, base price. On the primes, we've got another $10 per hundred. So where the choice are worth 40 to $45 more than the, the uh, old contract, then the prime are worth an extra 125 to 35. So with the selects, because we don't have the margin and we won't, don't really have the, uh, we don't really have the uh, market for a select of the $5 that we've added to each carcass, we've taken another four off of it in addition to whatever the weekly choice select spread is. So last week for this week's kill, I believe it's 591. So this week it would be, uh, it would be not minus 991. Hey JT, this is Garth. Can you repeat yeah. the math again, the old contract uh, as sure. opposed to the new? Yep. Now 118, right, minus 12, gets us to 106. And then the, the contract yield spec on the old con contract was 61%. So if you take the 106 and divide it by 0.61, it should come up with 173.70 something. Now, if you do the same with 118 minus eight and get to 110 and divide that by the yield spec of 61 and a half, on the, on the new contract, 0.615, you should come up with 178.86, I believe. Did that work out? Garth? Yes, thank you. Yep. So right up front, you know, on the yield spec, because we're, we're killing crossbreds, you know, if we've seen some come in that were maybe a, an Angus that we killed it was an Angus with a, a Holstein and also a little bit of a Jersey in there, whether it was an eighth or a quarter or whatever it was, you know, that those were yielding 60.2, maybe 60.4, um, you know, to the other extreme of some Holsteins that were, were crossed with a Charlet that have yielded from 63.3 to 63.6. So not knowing exactly where the, um, you know, the yield is going to be on these crosses in two to three years or five years, you know, we, we did increase the yield to 61 and a half from the, our old Holstein contract. Uh, but it really comes into play is where, where the suppliers or feed company or whoever's running a projection for suppliers is, is calculating what they think, you know, whatever group of feeders they bought, what they think they're going to yield. So for straight Holsteins, you know, if a guy has a 1400 pound outweight live and the average yield, you know, say at our plants is 59 and a half, well, that would leave you with an 830 or 35 pound carcass, roughly. So if you multiply the 833 pound carcass, by the 178, um, 80, or by the dress price, wherever we're locking them in, their gross dollar amount uh, will be a lot closer than if you're if we were trying to figure, you know, right now with February being at 130 and taking eight off of it, and and being at 122, you know, a 1400 pound steer at 122 is going to be live is in is gonna be about 50 to $60 too high if that, that animal is only gonna make 59 and a half. So it's one of the things we've spent quite a bit of time over the last six or eight weeks is, is just walking through suppliers as far as 
you know, when you're looking at, at um, gross dollars and what you're going to have left is you're buying feeders, that that's going to be a lot better way to, to run projections over the next few years, um, especially if we start seeing more of the, you know, the cattle yielding 61 and a half to 63 as a, you know, I think the, the industry will improve the genetics and tighten the genetics that, that we're using. Another big difference that, that we did, or a few changes anyway, the um, from 1,000 to 1,050 uh, on the old contract was minus 15 on, on the new one, it's minus 10, so we're not, you know, dinging them quite as hard. And from 650 to 700, we went from minus 15 to minus five. So uh, we're not dinging them as hard. They're outside of that range, we got a little more brutal because it's stuff that it just gets into things that we, we don't have much use for over 1050 or under 650. And honestly, a supplier with a 400 pound weight range dress, that's a, you know, live wise, that's a, that's a pretty big window for them to hit. One of the other uh, changes that I think is, is for the better is on the old contract, if they had anything that was sub-select, which would be a standard or a commercial and whatnot, it just fell to the daily cash market. Um, on the new contract, everything is priced off of wherever they get them, get them hedged or whatever their delivered base price is. So last year we had some guys that had locked in cattle at 180 to 190 dressed early in the year that by the time we got to July and August, you know, the, the cash market had dropped to 140 on a choice. And if they caught a, a standard, they were actually getting paid 105 to dollar ten on any of their outs, uh, which is just a, you know, as volatile as the market is, uh, moving that the sub select priced off of wherever they have them priced, I think will eliminate some of the risk of, of that happening again. Any questions, guys? Maybe one question you could answer for the audience is what kind of incentive is there for people to be raising these crossbred calves and how can those crossbred calves capitalize on added value in some of these contracts compared to the regular Holstein? Well, to be quite frank, the, the only incentive really is to the dairyman right now. I think there, there will be enough crossbreds around maybe over the next six months, eight months, uh, to where maybe the price of a straight Holstein calf and a crossbred uh, beef dairy cross calf uh, might have some the incentive for, um, you know, to, to buy them and purchase them. Right now, honestly, the industry is trying to figure out what to do with them. They're not a straight native. Um, they're not a straight Holstein. And, and they're kind of out in the middle where, as Larry was talking, we spent the last 15 years doing studies with CSU on shear test and taste test um, against CAB that, that where the, the people that were actually eating the beef preferred the, the straight Holstein over the, the CAB. And we've, we've used that over the last 10 years to, to get into places like Texas Roadhouse and some of these places around the nation that, that wanted a high, uh, cons high value, high quality, consistent uh, product. And now one of our fears is we're, we're contracting a few of them is what does our, our customer base, um, how do they perceive it when they get it? Is it, as we've talked for 10 years, that it's better and now we go back and say, well, now we're crossing straight Holstein with Angus and how do we explain it? But it, it could bring on a whole new, you know, uh, where we've got to start over trying to get it marketed. And one of our fears is, is that as other companies are, are and, and packing houses are, are slaughtering them, is what does their customer base think of it? Because if all of a sudden they, 
they quit killing them like they did in 2016, the industry is right back in the, in the same spot that it was then, that we've got too many of them for us to, to slaughter. So I have had some suppliers say that, that there's you know, a little bit added value in, um, in feed conversions um, and, and maybe calf health, uh, you know, through the crates and getting them to 300 pounds that maybe they don't fight the health issues quite as bad. Uh, but in addition that, you know, some suppliers that are raising baby calves and buying, you know, sticking with a, a 95 pound average Holstein weight, for example, compared to a 82 or five weight day old uh, Angus Holstein cross, that it, it takes more milk replacer to put that extra 10 pounds on rather than, than buying it to get them to the point that they can get dry matter uh, intake into them as you know a 115 or 20 pound calf, if that makes sense. I see uh, Tara Felix has a question. Uh, on the fab differences, she, she asks, uh, you talked about the only incentive being to the dairyman, but earlier you discussed the yield difference. I wonder if you would be willing to share more about the fab differences if you, that you've seen. You mentioned the 63 yield for Charlay versus 61 for Angus. How many head were in these fab studies and will, those, will the data be published? We haven't published anything yet, Tara. Uh, we did, uh, the Charlay cattle that we killed, we killed in our Arizona plant. They yield 63%. The fab difference was quite a little better than a Holstein. I, I, I think it was about 40 to $50 better than our Holstein yields. Uh, the, the Holstein Angus ones that we did, and I believe you might have uh, had those on feed at Penn State, uh, I think was about 13 to $14 better than a straight Holstein. Uh, so there are some fab differences. Uh, and when, when you talk about the quality of the meat that I think Jerry, uh, JT was discussing, uh, we had probably the, the, the main difference, a lot of people, I think most people understand a Holstein's fab yields are usually, you know, from 50, depending on who you talk to, 50 to $70 a head less than a native animal. I think it depends on the, on the Holstein and I, I, I wouldn't quote me on that because you hear a, lot, a wide range of what the value is. Uh, and probably, you know, at one time Holstein meat was, was sold at a discount anymore with the exception of a few of the middle meats. Uh, most, you know, probably the most notable would be the strip which is inferior because it's, it's shallower. So it gets sold at a discount compared to a native. But the, the main difference is the fab yields. But what we've seen has been all over the board. And, and like I said, they're, they've been pretty inconsistent. The, the Charlay cattle that we killed, there were 700 head of them. So it was a pretty good test. And it was a, it was a basically we did a whole shift of them as far as fat cattle. So we had really good data set on that. And there's another one from somebody else. Are you seeing a lot of cattle pulled forward due to the higher feed costs right now? What does that flow look like in the next six months and packing capacity? I'll speak on a little bit of it. As far as the packing capacity, and I, I think this is pretty much industry-wide, we've got a struggle right now with, with labor. And it's, like I said, it's about every plant we've got. And it, it started with COVID. And it doesn't seem to be getting a lot better. People aren't maybe wanting to come to work maybe as much uh, with a stimulus package. and They can stay home and not work as hard and, and, and the additional uh, unemployment. But I mean, we're, it, it looks like we can get 650, 660 dead if we push hard, maybe a little more than that if some people run Saturdays. The incentive's there. I mean, it's not that it's not profitable. It's just being able to get people to, to show up for work and, and keep a trained workforce. Uh, as, as far as people pulling cattle forward, we haven't really noticed any lighter weights yet. Uh, there's probably some cattle 
maybe a little bit backed up, not, not to the point that it was two or three or six months ago. Uh, I think we're, as an industry, we're getting a little more current and, and uh, th there might be a few, I mean, the on feed numbers will come out Friday and everybody will have a little be better feel for it. Uh, it's probably gonna show quite a little larger than a year ago, but one thing people need to understand is a year ago was just starting the first wave of COVID when these packing houses were basically shutting down for two or three weeks at a time when it, when it went through there back before we had any idea how to, I mean, was, I'm gonna be 60 years old this year and I, it was my first pandemic in the business and really the, the plants didn't know how to handle it and there wasn't very good guidance from anybody because nobody knew how to handle it. But if you look at the, the measures that the, the packing companies have put in force, and I think it's everybody from the, you know, the major packers to the small packers. I mean, everybody wears masks. Uh, they've got dividers in between uh, the workers. They've got dividers in between the workers in the break rooms. They've spread everybody out as best they can. And, and we've, seen, we've seen the infections go way down. And I think we had our last mass vaccination at a plant last Friday. So anybody that wanted to be vaccinated is vaccinated. Uh, and, but it wasn't a requirement, but it's roughly, I, I, I couldn't tell you the number, but it was a pretty good percentage of the employees did get vaccinated. And in addition to that, on the as far as cattle weights, up until about two weeks ago, you know, there was a point maybe two and a half weeks ago that, that June was trading at two seventy five to three dollars over the April board and way over cash. So there was incentive. You know, it was kind of telling the feedlots to take your last two weeks of April and move them to May and sell. And with the the basis adjustment that we've seen over the last two and a half weeks. Uh, and the market saying that they're only going to be worth 117 or 1750 this morning. You know, I think there'll be more incentive for feedlots to try to get them sold. And the whole key will be to Larry's point that if we can get, can we get to a 660 or 665 kill um, to, to start bringing the weights down? The weights have just started to fall over the last two weeks of kill below a year ago. Um, and probably won't bottom until we get, you know, till the end of May. But uh, that will help take a little bit of the, the beef production, total beef production off the market. Any other questions? The two groups of cattle that you mentioned, the Charlet and the Angus, from a quality grade standpoint, what type of differences? Uh, you know, we know that our dairy calves you know, typically do marble fairly well. You know, as we look at breeds such as Charlet or Limousine, those type of crosses, has, has there been any detriment to, to the quality grade? What, what we've seen so far, now the, the Charlet cattle were probably a little bit overfed. They weighed uh, almost 1,500 pounds. The grade on them was really good. There was no prime on them, but the, the uh, choice grade push 90%, which is about our plant average there. Uh, we, we see, you know, that's probably our best grading plant. Uh, the, and, and most of the Angus cross, we, we did at the Eastern plants, we, we did uh, three or four groups in uh, our Pennsylvania plant and three or four groups in our Wisconsin plant. And, we didn't see a lot of difference in the grade compared to a Holstein on the Holstein Angus. They were pretty close, you know, as far as the quality grade goes and the yield was just a touch better on them. Uh, but like I said, it's, there's not a, not a huge, uh, huge difference as far as the quality on them. Uh, to Tara's question, what are the plans for the future and where do you see this going uh, from a Packers perspective? You know, I think a lot of it, that we're feeling our way through, Tara, is the um, is what what our our customers going to think of it, you know, and and I think as as the semen companies realized they were here a year, probably a year and a half ago already, and kind of explained what had happened on the first go around, the the amount of tanks that they emptied, um, 
We've spoken with some genetic companies that are more involved with sex and semen. And, you know, that, that over the next a, a year from now, I think we'll see better uh, quality and, and tighter genetics being used on the, the, the dairy herd that they're breeding today that will help us maybe get to a point where we can start going to the Costco's and the, you know, Texas Roadhouse and, and getting feedback on, on what they're seeing uh, and how they feel about the meat. But the, the industry really has introduced something that up until now was, was either one or the other. You know, you're buying native meat or you're buying Holstein meat. And until there's, once we get to that consistency, on the finished product, I think we'll have a lot better idea, you know, what, what that day old baby calf is worth from a, a maybe a health and conversion uh, perspective to the feedlot and, and the added value that they're buying as a feeder steer, but also as a packer, what we're buying, you know, what, what added, added value it is a fab yields, uh, you know, same quality and, and good reception from the people that are actually going to consume it. Question from Kelly. You mentioned the new contract. Were there any other changes or updates than already discussed? Uh, no, that's the, I guess there's one on the old contract, the yield grade five was minus 20. And on the new contract, uh, it's minus four. Um, you know, there's been, on the both contracts, Larry and I here a few years ago started standing quite a few of the fours, the yield grade fours, um, and we're going to continue to do that. We've kind of proposed to the USDA that they need to come out with a an actual yield grade criteria for Holsteins and not just use the, the native one because the Holsteins tend to put most of their extra fat as, as KPH fat. And the way the yield grade criteria are set up now, you know, the pounds that, that a Holstein has the capability of putting in uh, as KPH fat bumps a lot of them. It's, it's left up to each uh, individual USDA grader and they take the weight of that KPH fat in their decision on what to call them as a yield grade uh, each individually, and they vary quite a little. And so when we were having guys that were yielding or getting 8% yield grade fours or fives, and a week later ended up with 55% yield grade fours and fives because it was a different grader rotating through the plant. They were just, it, it was way too inconsistent uh, for us to to deal with the, the phone calls, <laughs> to be real honest. Quite a little of the, you know, the KPH fat, and what, what uh, we give up by, by hot fat trimming is already built into the basis and, and how we're buying them. And that's um, why we'll continue uh, watching that. You know, a, a choice or a prime yield grade four or five uh, doesn't hurt as bad as what a select yield grade four or five does. Uh, a select, you know, when we don't have the quality, we don't have the margin and we've got extra waste that goes straight to rendering uh, can cut into it pretty quick. You know, if we average 16 pounds a side or 32 pounds per head, and you see animals come through that have 70 pounds, you know, that extra 30 some pounds of fat that you're paying a dollar 94 that goes straight to rendering at 15 cents can, can swing that, that animal 80 bucks a head pretty quick before it even hits cooler. One thing I wanna to touch on on the, the hot fat trimming, just so everybody knows, there, there's several scales in the plant. Now there's a pay scale that the cattle cross or hot weight scale that the cattle cross before hot fat trimming. So that the, the weight that, that you get paid on is the weight with the kidney, pelvic, and heart fat in it. And the kidney. And the kidney. Uh, basically, the reason some plants hot fat trim, it's easier to fab the animal because you're not 
you're taking the fat out of the internal cavity while it's warm and it's not cold and set up. So it's easier to fab the animal. And that's, that's why some plants hot fat trim, but you do get paid off the, the pay scale, which is before the hot fat trim area. It also slides through shoots a lot better if it's hot rather than cold. Right. Again, our question here, how does the other adjustment section compare versus the old contract? Well, other adjustments, I'm assuming that, I'm not quite sure. You know, we've got fours and fives, carcass weight range, and like uh, anything that's aged, they call over 30 on the kill floor. All of that is the, the same. Um, so Jay, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but it's, you know, we, we used to, guess maybe to put it this way, the main difference probably was that the, we stood 70% of the, or of choice, 30% select is what we kind of have the criteria on the old contract. Anything below 70 got discounted using the weekly choice select spread. Uh, anything over 70%, we gave a premium based on the, the weekly choice select spread. The new grid, so that, that was a, more of a tolerance or a variance. The, um, the uh, new contract is more of a, is more of a straight grid and each carcass is, is evaluated uh, based on its own merit. The, the muscle score part, you know, the same, same premiums and discounts, or it's basically straight discount on a, on a muscle score three or muscle score four. We've, um, we've had, you know, I think we're not seeing the muscle score issues maybe that we did 15 years ago when that was, was introduced into the, the contract. Um, I, I would think, that the genetics of the dairy herd has gotten a lot better, um, maybe because it's bigger dairies and more consistent genetics. But you look at the amount of milk that the cows are and the size of the cows and what they're able to put out today compared to 2000 or 2005, I think in itself the, the genetics of the dairy herd have taken care of the, the muscle score side of it. Tara has a, another question. Out of straight curiosity, what do you as a packer prefer or maybe where do you make more money, the purebred Holstein or the crossbred, or does it really matter? You know, honestly, it really doesn't matter. We're just, I mean, we, right now we're trying to understand it. Uh, we did build a, a Holstein brand, but obviously JVS has a Swift brand for native cattle. So other than changing you know, boxes during the middle of a run. It really doesn't matter to us. We just need to understand the value of them a little bit better. And I think we'll see that with more consistency in the genetics in the, in the next few years, as maybe these guys, you know, find a, a, a tighter set of bulls to use, you know, as far as their recommendations, as opposed to anything that's black hided. And, and you see it in the, in the auctions too, because if they, if they run, uh, a load of crossbred fat cattle into, into a fed cattle auction, uh, you know, they'll sort those cattle and if they look like a black Holstein, they'll basically bring Holstein money. If they look like a beef animal, they will bring beef animal money. It just depends on, on, on the animal. So the consistency is the key here. So as long as they're consistent and they're either consistently look like a Holstein or they consistently look like a native, it'll be easier to figure out what value there is to them, especially to the packer, along with the cattle feeder. And as far as preference, you know, for Larry and I, when, when we're ordering steaks, we've got a, a non-implanted program in Arizona that, that the cattle have never ever been implanted and we'll try to order the, the high choice or the prime steaks from there because they'll eat, this, they'll eat really good. So best meat there is. Larry and JT, I got a question or two questions for you. One goes back to the muscling score. 
you said you don't have many uh, issues with that anymore, but what kind of scoring system is that based on and who's calling the most scores? And then two, um, back to your mention of implants, um, what kind of effect are you seeing on implants and different implant strategies and what kind of recommendations would you guys recommend based on what you see or know sure. about lots of cattle that are implanted yeah. or not? The, the muscle score is, is called there at the grading chain by looking at the ribeye. It's, the criteria for it was, was 1.1 inches, square inches per hundred uh, pounds of, of carcass weight. If that, that's, that's what the criteria is. And that, so if you take a, uh, a 900 pound carcass, it was 9.9 .9 measured at the, the chine bone, if I remember it correctly. So that's, we're not seeing a lot of, of ribeye sizes these days that are below 10 square inches on the, on the Holstein drilling. Uh, as far as the implants, you know, I think that that's left up to, needs to be left up to each supplier based on, on how they, you know, good their management is and, and how good the calves are. Um, we're seeing and talking with, with one of the companies that, that sells a lot of implants around the, the nation and, and specifically in the Midwest, their, their territory reps. Um, it was kind of our, we, I throw my thoughts as far as TBA uh, versus a straight estradiol implant. And we kind of felt, uh, you know, the, the recommendations were, were the same, which are a lot of calves that, you know, might get an implant at 250 pounds or 300 pounds. Um, I know of some guys that give a row grow in the, you know, at day three when they come in the crates because they feel it helps the, the health. So there's all different kinds of, of implant strategies. When I was with Smithfield and helping them with basically working with all the cattle they had on feed around the nation, we tried 20,000 head with the, the Revlar XS. And it's, I can tell you that, you know, those cattle came in and they graded 45 to 55% choice, uh, no prime and seven, eight percent were outs uh, because it was just too hot. It was, it was too much TBA. Um, I kind of think personally, we got to where we didn't implant the, the cattle for Smithfield until they weighed 750. Um, we were basically shipping a couple thousand calves a week from the, the, the calf ranch. And we had the uh, luxury, if you will, that at 750 pounds, we could go in out of that 2000 head that shipped, say three and a half months before, and we could pull out the, the bottom thousand that maybe weren't gaining as good and implant those um, and leave the top thousand head where, where we never implant. And then at, again, at 1050, we would go back in out of the top thousand that had not been implanted yet. We we take the top 500 and leave them leave them uh, as never implanted, and that's you know how we kind of developed this never implanted program, or we were part of it uh, at 500 head a week, and we saw the top 500 head that had never ever been implanted. We'd average between 30 and 35 percent prime. Um, so that, that implant will knock the, you know, too much TBA can, can knock down the, the, the quality grade. And, you know, I, I guess I'm not saying that we never use it, but, you know, using TBA just as a terminal implant, which there are 200 days out there, Cinevex has got a one feedlot or a one grass that's 75%, basically the strength of the one feedlot that we've got people using. Um, and then we've got people using, you know, just doing an encore at 700, 700 pounds and not using any TBA because it fits their operation of, they've got 1600 head on feed and trying to get stuff implanted on a, 
on a timely basis and finding the help to do it, it just it fits their operation the best. So I think the TBA, you know, I've asked, I think it, it may be a part of a study uh, with some cattle that are on feed uh, with the Lanco in Texas. We'll, we'll have to find out if we can actually get it compared, but the Holstein meat tends to be a shade darker in color anyway. And my question to them was, you know, by adding TBA, a, a male hormone, are we causing the, the meat to be another shade darker, which can knock it down, you know, from a prime to a choice or a choice to a select. So um, as far as implants, I think if they were mine, I, I, and I was feeding them, I would probably feed them to 650 or seven before they had an implant and then um, at that point, use a straight estradiol implant and, and not enter, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the TBA into them until we, we hit the terminal implant. Uh, there's a question from Jay. Uh, no, the yield grade four or yield grade five was not uh, $40. It's, it's $10 a hundred. The, um, Yield grade five is ten dollars, just like the yield grade four on the new contract. On the old contract, it was it was twenty dollars a hundred. Did I did I answer your question on the implant well enough? Yeah, thank you. Are so you said that the Arizona plant you guys have the never ever program. Are there options like that in some of your eastern plants for producers? There are. It's it's. Uh, it's pretty hard to, to do. It's a little easier out there because it's actually in a real, I mean, there's five different feed yards that feed all of them. And it's the criteria down there is, is never implanted, but it's also no antibiotic the last 300 days. So in the dry climate, they don't, they don't have, find the need to run crumbles. You know, when a storm comes through, the weather's fluctuating. Uh, and we get a cough and, you know, running through the pen, which I think a lot of guys uh, that helps them in the, in the upper Midwest with their respiratory issues. Thank you. This is Garth. I've got a question. Uh, you mentioned the muscle scoring in the Holstein cattle has gotten better over the years. And maybe this leads into next week's conversation a little bit from the genetic standpoint. When we're selecting those beef bulls, it, uh, of course, ribeye area uh, is a criteria, but with that muscling score getting better over time in the dairy cattle, is selecting for frame size maybe a more appropriate way to improve yield? That, that Most of the issues we had with, with muscle scores was when people were still feeding a lot of yearling Holsteins. You'd see it a lot more in them, and I, I'm assuming it's because that they were you know, they were taller and uh, before they ever started putting on weight. If you're calf feeding them, you, you, you don't have issues with the muscle scores. And that's, you know, on the, the Charlays, the genetics behind those, that was a, like a frame size six bull. So I think it is, I think frame size does play into it uh, as we're, you know, people are crossing. But then the, the, you know, the marbling and whatnot would also play into it also. We have another question that just popped up in the chat. Uh, could you repeat the percent prime and percent select for straight Holsteins? As the beef bulls used to produce crosses become more consistent, will focus on quality or yield traits and crossbreds have a greater impact on value at the packer level? Yeah, I, I think it will. You know, the, the Holsteins have the ability to grade very well. I mean, the, the ones that we don't implant through, you know, in Arizona, we've got, um, you know, they'll come in from consistently from 25 to 35% uh, prime and very few selects on them. Uh, I've got guys in the upper Midwest that, that, you know, looking through weekly data, it's about the top 35 or 40% of the contracts that we kill that I was looking at in Green Bay the other day, you know, average 19% prime. And they're, they're guys that just don't implant. So it's the genetics are going to play something into it. 
Uh, but I also feel that, you know, where su suppliers pick their, their implant program that works best for them um, will we'll play into it, if more so than maybe even the genetics, because the genetics on the Holstein side, are, I think, are there. Not saying that if you don't cross them with a, a no quality bull that, you know, you can strip that out of them, but the implant will have, have more, more impact on it. As far as the, the value at the packer level, you know, like we were talking, there's, there's been a, a big shift to higher quality. Our export business now, you know, compared to the late 90s is for, for prime and whatnot to to Japan and, and Southeast Asia is, is, you know, a big part of our business uh, is that higher quality meat. And that's what they're, you know, willing to buy. Another quick question, I guess, here um, on the crossbred side of things. Um, as the genetics get a little bit better for the crossbreds, and I think this kind of goes into the last question we had here, um, and the yield improves. So you're talking about 63 and a half percent on those char crosses. As the dressing percent or the yield becomes more comparable to a beef animal, do you see those crossbred calves being marketed more like native cattle compared to the Holstein side of things? I, I do. I, I think that they, you know, like I said, even today, you know, if you run a set of crossbreds through an auction, I mean, if they look like a native, they'll sell like a native. And I mean, I, I, I think the fab yields can be improved. That's, that's a given. And, and like I said, a lot of that, you know, is genetics. And, and I think that probably part of it's in how you feed them. Because I think if they, if they, if they have more traits of a straight beef animal, and just for an example, there's a, there's a company, but you know I'm not giving a plug to them, but there's a, a group in Minnesota that actually has crossed the jerseys with Holsteins and limousines, and and uh, they seem to sell them pretty well. So I'd say somebody knows something, you know, about you know fab yields and so forth when they get them to the plant, because a packer's not, I mean, we're, we're not known for giving a premium for something that doesn't deserve a premium. So I, I think there's definitely, you, you just need to look at the genetics if they tighten it. Uh, if you're using a high grading, high yielding Angus bull that, that, that they've selected for this purpose, I, I think you're probably going to help the cause all the way along. And, and, you know, if you're selling them, you know, by the yield, and they're going to yield as well as a native, then they'll darn sure bring as much as a native. And I've heard from, from different suppliers that, um, that they've, they've gotten along the best if they feed them and treat them feed wise, uh, the same as a straight Holstein that pushing them, you know, on a high energy ration, uh, from 275 or 300 that they, they get the, the better conversions rather than, more like a native trying to, to uh, grow them on silage or running them on grass or like that, that they just, they, they tend to get too much frame and, and grow out of the, the calf fed side of it. A few quick announcements. Uh, next week, same time, uh, we plan on having the second session for this program where we will focus on genetic selection or sire selection for producing crossbred. So as we kind of talked today or Larry and GT um, contributed today, um, there's inconsistency with some of the crossbreds that are being produced today. Um, some shortcomings because of that, you don't have consistent uh, um, performance from those animals as far as fab yields and stuff like that. They may be less than Holsteins, similar to Holsteins, or maybe a little bit better. Um, so um, sign in next week if you're interested in learning a little bit more about um, genetic selection, how we may be able to improve uh, the performance of these crossbreds when they go to the packer level. Uh, another thing I'd like to add here real quick before we 
sign off. I noticed your speaker next week's from the Semental Association. I will tell you that we did quite a few Angus Semental Holstein crosses, and they our data was better on them than it was on the Angus. And I'm I'm not sure on the Penn State ones. I believe some of those cattle were were uh, Semental Angus Holstein crosses too. I don't see any more questions coming in the chat, so I think uh, we can wrap this presentation up. I'd like to thank our speakers for today um, very much for um, having a conversation with us about what to expect when it comes to crossbreds um, at the packing level. And